Hello, everyone. So, um, first of all, a little bit about myself. So, okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, my name is Anatoly. Um, I'm a software engineer at the Scala Center. Before that, uh, I joined um, at EPFL as a compiler engineer in 2019, so five years already. And since then, I got uh, really interested in the community and how to structure the community uh, so that the software is sustainable and uh, reliable and uh, is, uh, can survive for, uh, for a while. Uh, because um, I believe that software is people first and foremost. It's people who create the software, it's people who maintain the software when something breaks, and it's people who keep the software up to date uh, with the other software. So that's what I've been focusing on for the last two years. It's uh, community projects around uh, the compiler, first and foremost, but also uh, around the other uh, Scala Center-led projects. So, during this talk, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about one of the most successful community projects that uh, I've been involved in. Um, yeah, during my time at the Scala Center, it is the Compiler Academy project. I would like to tell you how it was motivated to come to existence, how it all started. And I'm going to tell you how it evolved, how it is going nowadays. And the purpose of this talk is to tell you um, how this can be done so that if you have your own, for example, open source project, you can use the same technology to create the community, to build the community around your own project. So in, essentially to increase the number of uh, maintainers of that project, to decrease the bus factor, to spread the word. Um, so the Compiler Academy, what is it? It is um, online pair programming sessions, so it is uh, run by the Scala 3 core teams, so people who develop the compiler. It is primarily focused on the compiler itself, and it is about fixing the compiler issues. So think about um, people who are enthusiastic about the compiler, so anyone can be anywhere ar around the world. If you're enthusiastic, you're the target audience. Meeting once per month, uh, in small pair programming groups, two to five people, to fix compiler issues. There are usually experienced people, like members of the Scala 3 core team, uh, that, help, um, that help guide people in those teams, but this is essentially what it is. And the journey of this project spans two and a half years. It started in 2021. Uh, during 2022, it went through scaling and uh, experimentation. I think experimentation is more proper word than scaling here. And in 2023, it reached stability. So we tried uh, everything that we wanted to try to figure out the limits of the, uh, of the project, of the format, and of the um, circumstances. Because compiler is a complicated project, so not every newcomer can um, start working on it using this format easily. So let me tell you about those phases. So why, why it is important to, to know about, the, about how it all developed is um, so that if you want to start your own project around your open source project, to gather community around your open source project, that might give you some insight about how it uh, may go. So Inception was in summer of 2021. And uh, what was summer 2021? It was COVID, it was COVID lockdown, so um, we had remote work. Um, we were not allowed to come to the office. And as a consequence, there was a challenge of staying in touch uh, to get together with the teammates. And so the format change might present some challenges to the convenient workflow. Uh, another thing that happened uh, during that time was the release of Scala 3.0. That was the first stable version of uh, Scala 3. It was just, just released in spring of 2021. And what does it mean? It means that um, now we are uh, stable. We are officially not experimental anymore. We are released. We are gearing towards industry. We want to say that uh, we are done experimenting. 
please switch, please migrate, you can migrate. What it means is that more people started to migrate to Scala 3, more people started to try Scala 3. Uh, what it means is more issues get discovered, and uh, as a consequence, more um, issue, more, more maintenance burden on the core team of the compiler. Uh, and what is the core team of the compiler? It is, uh, first and foremost, it is LAMP, which is the lab at EPFL, um, at the university that develops Scala. And uh, lab, uh, laboratory, it is a scientific unit, first and foremost. The maintenance of the compiler is not its uh, primary task. So um, all of this presents some challenges uh, around the project. So we started to look at uh, how we can make this project more sustainable in the long run. We, we are exploring, exploring um, several different avenues. One of them was involving more the community into the project. So we know that there are many people around the world who are enthusiastic about the compiler. We know that because uh, they uh, contribute, they submit pull, pull requests, they participate in discussions on the contributors forum. So we wanted to involve them. So. How did we start? We started small. We started uh, with small pair programming sprees that were um, aimed at knowledge transfer within the core team. So we started uh, small in the sense uh, we tried to incubate a successful project first in our um, in-house before scaling it, before opening it to the community, so that when we go to the community and uh, welcome new people, we have a format that uh, is already proved to work. So yeah, internal only. So internal only means um, the teams that uh, were involved at the time actively and currently are also involved in the compiler itself, full time paid to do that. So this is LAMP, this is Scala Center, this is Virtus Lab, and this is Lightband. Uh, we started with those four uh, teams. And uh, it was done online first for the reasons of COVID. So at the time it was not obvious how to do that because it was only emerging, like Zoom was only like coming as a platform to do those things. If you are doing it before COVID, we might not even consider doing it online because we simply didn't know that it's possible to do this video conferencing via Zoom. So shaping it took essentially half a year to make sure that the format works well. The way we did it is we were running those sprees, those issue fixing sprees uh, within those four teams. And uh, we were collecting feedback from people uh, that participated in, in, in those sprees after every spree. Um, there were more or less seven people, sometimes more, sometimes less, attending on average from those uh, four teams um, combined. And uh, around four issues were fixed per spree uh, during the first iterations of the spree. The sprees were once per month, essentially, once per three weeks, but it's essentially one per month. And it took seven iterations over five months to get it right. It means that um, after every iteration, we collect feedback and uh, feedback collection, how does it look like? Uh, it's we asking two questions. What worked well? What didn't work well? And uh, five months it took us to make sure that uh, there are no more negative feedback coming, so people are satisfied with everything. During the first five months, these seven iterations, there were always some sins. Some sins like, for example, very stupid sins like, for example, conference in software, it's CPU, and you cannot really compile the code because you're experimenting with, uh, not only with Zoom, but also with the alternative conference in software like um, this uh, game-like software where it simulated the conference environment and you can move physically into this space to other people and talk to them. Uh, also, another challenge that was presented was that of a format, because um, obviously not everyone had the same availability, um, not everyone was comfortable with the same duration, so we had to find a compromise that worked well for uh, most of the people. Um, another thing is agenda and logistics. Um, so agenda is uh, how to structure what to do 
during the spree itself, so it is two hours, how exactly to structure it, what uh, needs to happen in the first half an hour, what needs to happen in the next half an hour, and so on and so forth, how to, how to shape it. And logistics is about organization, organizing it. I'll get into it uh, in more details down the line. But uh, it was also um, presented some challenges that required simplification. So what we discovered is that the simpler the better, as a rule of thumb, not only for the organizers, because it's like less work to do, it means um, you're less likely to make a mistake, but also for the attendees, because the attendees, they need to be briefed about uh, what they're doing there, what are the rules of the game, and if the rules are a bit too complicated, then people tend to forget and people tend to misunderstand them, uh, and um, it's harder to run such kind of project. So um, the so that was um, that was the phase of incubation. So at the phase that I was telling you about, we were incubating the project in house without letting the external people in. In those five months, we stabilized and we felt like we are ready to welcome the external contributors in. And so opening that, uh, opening opening it presented some more challenges. Uh, so first of all, uh, how we went about opening the project. Uh, where do you find people when you um, need to reach out via this model? Well, it's Twitter, obviously, because at least at the time everybody was on Twitter. Now it's probably Twitter and Mastodon and Discord as well. Um, we made a Slack channel for coordination. Um, we encountered a bunch of uh, challenges that we didn't encounter previously when we were running it in-house because uh, our teams uh, they are based in Europe and now we opened it and people are based all over the world. So we had to move the time zones um, a little bit to accommodate for everyone else. Here it was also important to collect the feedback, um, to ask people what works well, what doesn't work well. So more negative feedback started to come when we started to open up the spree for the external people. Um, another novelty that we introduced was uh, onboarding call. Because in-house everybody knows what we are doing, everybody knows what are the rules of the game. However, when we are talking about inviting a contributor from uh, that submits uh, submitted two or three PRs on GitHub, and uh, doesn't have otherwise enough experience with the compiler, they do not know exactly how things are done and they may need some guidance. And so what we organized is an onboarding call, so whoever wants to join the project, uh, they um, obligatory they meet with one of our representatives, uh, during which we explain them how we do things and um, how like uh, how they can participate. I guess the main learning point from that uh, onboarding call was that people are frequently underestimating their own ability, their own potential to contribute, because they simply do not know where to start. And uh, often, just half an hour speaking to a person is enough to show them, like, uh, okay, you can go here, and this is the instructions how to install the compiler. And uh, you just show up, show up during the event without any special pre prerequisites. You just have, need to know Scala, and then you will be able to already pick up something about the compiler. So that was uh, also a way to encourage the contributors that otherwise was, wouldn't be able to be uh, confident enough to join the project. Another big challenge that we encountered was a team balancing. So the thing is, when you're talking about contributors, they all have different levels of expertise. This is true even when we are talking about the in-house people who um, actually work on the compiler itself, because there are different areas of the compiler and uh, one person might be expert in one area, another in another. But when you're speaking about attracting more external people, it's even more true because some people, they might already have some compiler background at all. Like, for example, at their work, they deal with the compilers. Some people, they might not. So the deal is that you need to know the people you're dealing with and you need to pair them properly one with another. So the team size for pair programming is usually two to five people. 
and you might get 10 registrations, for example. And the question is, how do you team people up one with another so that everybody gets most value out of uh, the spree? Uh, so another thing is that some people, they might have stronger preferences on which issues to work. That is usually the case when some contributor who is like recurrent contributor who, has, uh, uh, who contributes outside uh, spree. Um, they already have ongoing issues they're working on. And they might not be happy if uh, they register for that issue, and then you switch them to another issue. So how did we solve that? What was the pipeline? So it's a simple Google form where people specify the desired issue that they want to work on. Uh, we want to ensure that at least one mentor is present in each team and a mentor is defined as a person who is paid to work on the compiler at least it was defined at the time of um, the scaling like that and uh, initially it took three hours to balance those teams why well because you see these 10 registrants who came who ex expressed the desire to participate in the spree and then you they usually register for different issues so it's like one issue per person. So they, there are many issues, so usually they do not um, hit the same issue when they register. So you need to decide whom to put with whom. And to do that, you need to individually message every person and say, OK, I would like to put you on that issue and not on the original issue. That takes time. So one innovation that we made to reduce uh, this uh, team balance in time is to make it so that by default they give their consent to put them on a different issue. They can opt out of it, there is a flag during the registration to opt out of uh, being put on a different issue. However, by default they are um, informed that we, the admin team, can change their issues that they are assigned, that they are registered for. And that change alone, it brought down the um, team balance in time from three hours per spree to just 20 minutes per spree. So when I'm talking about stabilizing the spree over time, I'm talking about those sins, um, those little sins that uh, can dramatically reduce the time for maintenance and dramatically simplify the event. So that was the phase of the inception, the phase where we incubated the project internally in-house. And uh, we were able to attract some initial contributors from, from the outside, stabilize the spree from uh, their perspective. The next phase um, started in 2022, and it was us trying to push the limits of the project and see what we can do with it. So during that time, we tried to do two things, essentially. First, we tried to scale the spree. So the question was, can it really contribute a um, significant amount of uh, solved issues so that uh, ultimately make a, an impact on the issue count, on the issue tracker? And also, we tried to produce the educational content ar around the compiler in hopes of making it simpler for people who have no background at all in the compiler to get started. So the objective of the scaling challenge was to fix more issues and to increase the number of the contributors. And here we unfortunately encountered a bottleneck because it turned out that people, that the newcomers who come without any prior compiler experience, they, well, they need guidance, they need mentors and uh, mentors in the sense somebody who, who works on the compiler full time and can competently answer questions about the compiler. So um, at the time we uh, realized that we cannot effectively scale the amount of mentors because that would involve hiring new members full time to work on the compiler in the core teams, which is not so trivial. Um, Another bottleneck we encountered is that many issues, say, were discussion issues. So what does that mean? It means that um, there needs to be a decision made on how to fix them. So you open the issue, you do not even have a clear solution, clear way to fix it, even if you wanted it, even if you sat down and actually put uh, the hours that you wanted to put in, because it requires a consensus from the core team, from other people, on 
that your fix is actually the right fix to do. For example, like a typer error. The compiler complains that uh, there is um, a code that doesn't compile. Well, some of the people at the core team might argue that, uh, okay, the compiler is actually correct here. It's against the type theory. Some people might argue, no, it's, uh, it's, it's not correct. It's, it should compile because it, for example, compiled in Scala 2. We have a lot of such situations like corner cases in the compiler that the code that compiled in Scala 2 doesn't compile in Scala 3. Like very corner cases, but uh, they still exist. So this is not solvable via the issue spree. It's just not the right tool to solve it. The right tool to solve this kind of problem is the new uh, governance around the compiler so that people uh, like uh, come into the consensus uh, together about what needs to be done effectively, which we are also working on at the Scala Center. Uh, and uh, another thing that we were doing as part of the scaling is uh, we migrated to Discord. So previously we had this closed Slack channel that we invited people who wanted to contribute to. Now we, uh, we integrated with the official Scala Discord. Why? Because, well, on the Discord we already have the channel um, for people who contribute to the compiler. So now we felt more confident that the project is mature enough for us to be integrated with this place where the compiler is discussed anyway. So another vector besides uh, scaling was the YouTube channel. So that's uh, educational content. So what we are trying to do is make this little Scala 3 Compiler Academy YouTube channel, which had videos about the compiler. So we took people who are the core team people, and we uh, asked them to make a little talk about uh, what they do, about their area of expertise. We put it on YouTube. So far, it's, um, we have 500 plus subscribers, 380 hours of uh, watch time of uh, those 14 hours, 14 videos that we have published, which is not too much but you, by YouTube standards, but it is already something when we are talking about the um, compiler. Currently, we are not actively developing this uh, dimension because uh, we recently had like, a little bit of uh, change in the compiler team. So we had uh, many people who are like um, long-term contributors living from the compiler team, uh, more people who, uh, new, who are new PhD students coming to the compiler team. So it was an update of uh, the personnel, personnel in the core team. So we didn't uh, have the ability to bootstrap that effectively with them. To make those challenges, um, to make those uh, scaling uh, happen, to, to help the scaling, we were also developing our automation uh, around the spree. So that was uh, another important thing to um, make sure that the spree is uh, not taking too much time from the person organizing it. So this is how it was. What you see here on the screenshot is a checklist. And this is a precise sequence of steps that a human um, admin needs to do every time to um, bootstrap the spree. And it's, um, I would argue this is the right way to get, uh, get started with it because some of those steps, they are of course automatable. Like you can write a Python script, of course, but why, why would you? If you still do not know if the format that you're encoding in code is going to work, maybe you will need to rewrite your code in some time. So you compose uh, for yourself a checklist that you yourself as an admin follow to make the spree happen every time. Like here you can see uh, what you need to do immediately after the, the day after the spree happened. And essentially it tells you exact steps to open the next registration of the next spree. Of course, this is not uh, very efficient. So once the spree um, stabilized, once the event stabilized, it makes sense to automate it a bit. Well, how exactly would you do that? Well, if you write it, um, like, of course, one way to do it is via writing code, interfacing with uh, APIs that we have on, on all the services that run this project. However, we came up with a better solution because the problem with code is that it needs maintenance, APIs break, and you need somebody experienced with the project to maintain it. This is 
not very optimal. So what we did is we uh, went with no-code solutions. On the left here, you can see um, essentially um, analog of uh, Google Sheets, but it is Airtable and it is more like databases, more like a mix of a database and a spreadsheet. It has better in API interface to interface with it. Um, and to do stuff like semantic filtering, like filtering a field by a, like knowing its data type, like for a date, for example, you can filter by the um, filter as you would filter a date. And to the right, you can see a no-code solution that is essentially a visual programming language. So every circle there is an action that a program takes and instructions that the program takes. And you can see that they have icons on them and the icons are of um, popular services, such as Discord, such as Slack, such as GitHub. So essentially it's like a no-code solution that interfaces with uh, lots of external services. And you can essentially wire those uh, bots together to help you maintain your meetings, your social events, your um, open source events. So that also dramatically simplified the maintenance of the project. So that was a period of experimentation we covered. So to summarize that period, we explored three directions. First, it was uh, the scaling of the spree, which didn't work out because uh, it was challenging to scale the mentors. Uh, second, it was the um, Compiler Academy YouTube channel, the educational content, which somewhat worked we can argue because still the newcomers to LAMP, for example, I know that they use those videos to get up to speed with the compiler. And finally, it was scaling the automation to make sure that the spree can essentially run itself. So what is the current state? Here you can see a little diagram about the number of attendees of the event for the past iterations of the spree, essentially. So what you can see from here is that it's not too big of an event, so the compiler is still a little bit niche scene to uh, get into, but it's fairly stable. So those people who are um, interested in the compiler, they join and there is, um, there is a fairly stable amount of people attending every time, around seven people each time. If you count the statistics, it's uh, 80 plus unique participants since the spree got started. The current purpose um, is um, knowledge transfer between people. So if previously we started it uh, with uh, hopes to uh, try to make an impact on the issue count, we now switched our purpose to um, knowledge transfer primarily. So it is for everyone who is interested in the compiler to learn the compiler. And uh, now we have fully off-handed it, uh, its management to LAMP, so the research unit, not the Scala Center. So why is that? Well, it's more efficient that way because they deal with the compiler more than the Scala Center. So it just makes sense for the admin to be one from LAMP because that way uh, that admin can know uh, how to best compose teams, like what are the expertises, what people are working on. So it's good to have somebody more knowledgeable, more close to the compiler as an admin. And also the automations that I was talking about helps uh, help uh, with that because uh, it doesn't take the admin too much time. It's essentially uh, balancing teams that is most difficult. And finally, a few words about the technology, like how, uh, like what is the format, what is the behind the scenes of that uh, event. Uh, we work on the three week cycle. So there is uh, a spree every three weeks. It starts from the uh, week minus two, which is registrations week, which where people can indicate that's what they want to join the next iteration of the spree. So the registration is per spree, not per not per project. Then in the week minus one, so one week before the spree, the spree admin is going to announce the teams. So the fact that you registered at the spree means that you know that you're going to participate, but you do not know in which team. Uh, during the week minus one, the spree admin is going to announce the teams. So now you can start preparing for the issue, maybe reaching out to your teammates, maybe looking at the issue itself, maybe hacking a little bit uh, on it uh, yourself. And finally, it all ends with uh, the 
spree itself, which is uh, on week zero, which is essentially two hour long coding session. It starts with uh, a little briefing for people to know the structure, maybe five minutes. Uh, then people code for one and a half hours. And uh, finally, d during the final 15 minutes, we have a debrief session, which is essentially every team has a person presenting what they did, uh, what were the challenges, and giving the feedback about how it went. Maybe something needs to be improved. The maintenance work needed to maintain such kind of event is currently as follows. So most work goes into issue selection and team balancing. So one important aspect of such kind of uh, open source event is to um, correctly pick the issues. Because if you pick up something super complicated, then you're not going to have uh, like many contributors having fun. You need to pick up something beginner friendly. Um, another thing is uh, statistics collection, which uh, is not too difficult, which is essentially you need to listen during that debrief what people, um, how many people solved the issue, some, how many people submitted at least a PR, and that can give you some insight about the effectiveness of your issue selection, of your team's balancing. Uh, interviewing new participants, now it is uh, dropped, uh, this uh, part, so we optimized it away. But essentially it was there to welcome new people and to explain them how, like, what, what is the procedure. We found that we can also run this pre pretty well without it. Finally, it is uh, um, some work that also needs to be done is uh, coordination, reminder messages on GitHub, on Slack, uh, etc. So that is also optimized away because it is automation essentially. So essentially what the person uh, admin needs to do after the automation is set up is to work with people to figure out uh, the teams every time the event happens. So in case you would like to start a community like so. One big thing to ensure the success is to ensure the mentor's availability. So you need to have already a bunch of people, maybe two, maybe three, that can also work with uh, smaller amounts of people who are more or less regularly contributing and who more or less can show the new people the ropes. And um, you can you can already get started with such an event if you have the mentors. Without mentors, it's more challenging because it is a higher entry barrier for new people and it's more difficult for them to get started. And finally, it's uh, pretty important to figure out the communication channels, which is GitHub, GitHub for issues. Discord well, works well for communication. Once you have those two components, you can already run your own event, and that can give you more contributors for your own project. So if you have a Scala project that you would like to like, um, make sure that it is sustainable, that's something for you to consider. And of course, um, automations, so the backend, I was, uh, as I was already telling you, so it's not to be underestimated the amount of maintenance work that needs to be put into, uh, into communicating the events. So the automations help with that a lot. And one more thing before Q&A, uh, there is one iteration of similar spree happening on Saturday, collocated with this conference which is offline and which is not limited to the compiler. Uh, we have uh, at least one more project that is going to be introduced. So if you would like to experience uh, the format yourself, but uh, offline, then please come on Saturday. It's uh, the same venue at 9 o'clock, 9.30 o'clock. So if you're still around, please come. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, I guess no. So, uh, yes? Uh, about uh, Scala Center projects, uh, are they following uh, this? Are they going to to use this process? 
Yes, so uh, as far as I know, uh, currently only Scala CLI is the uh, only one uh, project that is also uh, following the same process. I mean, they're working, they're participating in the same spree that uh, we are organizing online. The Scala Center projects, we focus more on offline sprees. So whenever there is a conference like this one, we usually collocate a spree event where we, like whoever from the team comes, they are, represent their own projects. And people who come to the conference, they can work uh, on such projects in the format of the spree, but offline. Okay, in case there are no more questions, and thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you can, please come to the spree on Saturday.